Good morning. It is so wonderful to see all of you here. Um, for those of you who I have not had the privilege to meet, I try to go around and, and say hello to everybody, but I'm Myrta Martin, and I have the privilege to serve as the ninth president of Fort Hay State University. So welcome, welcome home to Fort Hay State University this morning. We're thrilled to have you here. We welcome anyone and everyone to this beautiful campus of Fort Hay State University and to the beautiful facility that we are housed here today, the Robin Center. It is great to have all of you here in person so that you can interact directly with an, our entrepreneurs. We also welcome viewers who are watching live over the internet as we watch later this also in archive format. We welcome the youth entrepreneurs who are watching and others who are watching here in Kansas, in our nation, and be young. Be delighted. Look at what we're doing at Fort Hay State University. Our motto, forward thinking, and we're already are not just words. It's what we are, it's who we are, and it's what we live, and it's what you will see here today. Entrepreneur Direct is a speaker series that features successful entrepreneurs in an informal setting, sitting accessible to you, our students, our faculty, our staff, members of our community. The program is intended to connect to students with successful entrepreneurs who have stories and who have advice to share. So listen to their advice. They have arrived. A panel, this panel will also ask questions about entrepreneurship and it will encourage you to ask questions of them. So this is an interactive conversation. Make sure that you make your voice count. We have a moderator and panelists who will initially ask questions of the presenters. You're encouraged to tweet during the question and answer period and to voice questions. And the tweet is FHSU E Direct. Our moderator is Dr. Mark Bannister Dean of the Fort Hay State University College of Business and Entrepreneurship. In addition to an academic career, Mark has been involved in a number of startup and ongoing businesses as a co founder, investor, participant, and consultant. We also have two panelists, Mr. Henry Schroller, instructor of management and entrepreneurship, a dear friend and an incomparable human being. Henry is a business owner, a consultant, and a Hayes City Commissioner. Charles Wolf, instructor of management and entrepreneurship. Henry is a business owner as well. Uh, he, Charlie, has had um, over 20 years of private industry experience before joining higher education. So he has lived it, and he's able to share that practical application in his classes so that our students are inspired and that they know that what they're learning is not theory, but actually things that they will need to be successful entrepreneurships. Our panelists are among the key faculty who have developed a world-class 12-credit entrepreneurship certificate that is open to any student on our campus here at Fort Hay State University. I'd also like to point out that as many of you enter this morning in this beautiful facility, you may have had the opportunity to receive a handout with information about the Dane G. Hansen Entrepreneurship Scholarship Hall. This nationally unique living and learning experience will open this coming August 2016. It is open to students of any and all majors. It is given to us and we are able to build it through the generosity of the Dane G. Hansen Foundation who has embraced our vision of a future, a future where we're able to churn out entrepreneurs so that they can improve the human condition and so that they can act as a multiplier to the economic development of our great state and the region here in Kansas as well as to our nation. I encourage you to become part of this unique opportunity that only Fort Hay State University will offer. You are our greatest ambassadors. I have asked the faculty and the staff and the, and the students to be less humble be less humble. Be excited about the opportunities that abound here at Fort Hay State University. Be excited about the future that we are able to offer you because you, our students, are not just our ambassadors. You are our greatest future 
and we are committed to inspiring you and to teaching you and to educating you and to instilling wisdom in you so that you can go out and become the leaders that you are destined to be. I thank you for being here this morning. And again, I welcome you to your home, Fort Hay State University. Thank you. Thank you, President Martin. Madam President, or Andres, could we have that microphone? Please? Good morning, I'm Mark Bannister, Dean of the College of Business and Entrepreneurship, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers this morning. I have to say that uh, this demonstrates the type of talent, ability, and success that can come from a Fort Hayes State University graduate. All three of these are people that we're extremely proud of and we're very pleased to have back on campus uh, this morning. And I say this morning, they'll be talking to classes and groups this afternoon and even taking part in a dinner this evening. So we have a very full itinerary for them. And this is the first of several events. Paul Krauss is somebody that has opened the door for a number of student tours, faculty tours, as uh, we have uh, uh, visited the Denver and Boulder area and, and uh, learned about uh, the technology and the startup communities in that area. He is a BFA art and graphic design graduate from 1996. He is a managing partner and founder at Saltbox Studio in Boulder, Colorado, which designs customer experiences optimized within the client's technological constraints. Saltbox Studio has created unique applications powered by technology platforms, including Salesforce.com, SAP, Oracle Cloud, and homegrown systems. Krauss has experience working in other startup and young businesses, including Datu Health, Aprino, and Wall Street On Demand. Upon graduation from Fort Hayes State University, he worked for Giant Step, a Leo Burnett company based in Chicago. In fact, Paul was mentioning earlier that uh, when he was living in Chicago, he was living in the Wrigleyville area with his, uh, his first job, an exciting place to be. But we're very glad to have him back in this part of the country. Our second speaker, Tanya Valine is an MBA grad from 2000, and she is a co-owner of Working Girls Design, which designs, creates, and sells cards, books, and gifts nationally. Working Girl products can be found in locations ranging from unique boutique shops to Steinmart and Walmart. Working Girls Design has exceeded $8 million in sales. Previously, Valine worked in the Las Vegas real estate world and as the first director of academic marketing here at Fort Hayes State University. And Tanya has deep roots. Her parents were alumni as well as her, and she once told me she literally was born on campus, that her parents lived here at the time that, uh, that she was born. And I didn't realize until this morning that two of our three speakers truly had their roots in the bustling metropolis of Elmina, Kansas, that both uh, Tanya and Jeremy Horn who graduated with a BBA in finance in 2004, have roots in Almina. Jeremy is a co-founder of the Wichita Brewing Company, a microbrewery with two locations in Wichita. The Wichita Brewing Company is committed to making a great handcrafted beer and quality wood-fired pizzas. Additionally, Horn is vice president of investments at American Underwriters Life Insurance Company in Wichita. He is managing partner of WEB, Investments Group, LLC, and managing member of Horn and Her Holdings, LLC. Quite a variety of, of uh, initiatives and investment activities. Well, I welcome the audience, and we are going to begin with our first speaker, Paul Krause. Thank you, Mark. Everybody hear me? Okay. So, First, you missed one part of my resume that probably wasn't on LinkedIn. And when I was about this big around the family pond that we sold fishing memberships, I sold cans of worms to fishermen. So that's, that's one bit of, that's probably the first break that I had. Um, you know, when I left Fort Hayes uh, for Chicago, for Giant Step as a designer in a, in a digital ad, ad agency, uh, that job didn't exist when I started Fort Hayes. Um, it took me five years to get through school um, just working and, and making sure that, that my school was paid for. That's the affordable success part that I, I always enjoyed. Um, 
But it really, it, it meant something, and it's kind of been something that's carried with me through this whole time. And it's something that's in the back of my head of, I've got to stay ahead of things. I've got to stay in front, and, and uh, that's always a reminder for me. I'll have a prompt forward. Marks my mouse today. This, this quote, are you afraid, was the first and probably the last question in that five-year span that Chaiwat Tumsajarat, uh, the design uh, chair at, uh, in the art department, gave me. And it was something that he prompted through, through all your projects. It, it, he helped you overcome risk. He helped you overcome fear. And why would I be afraid of a project? Well, would, would I be afraid of, of failing? Would I be afraid that, that my friends wouldn't think that I'm good? But, you know, he always asked, are you afraid? And it was kind of a, in a com comforting, warm message that he, he, he gave to us. Um, and for the second part of this, I, I want to say that we have, uh, we have this statement that, that carries me through. Because today, as we talk about entrepreneurship, we do talk about risk. You know, do I have enough money? Do I have enough time? Uh, some of the things that I say in, in, in our world is time is your friend and your enemy. And, you know, if you run out of money, if you run out of time, you have to, you have to be on your feet and think again. You know, I, I, through the, the list of companies that I've worked for that, that Mark rattled off, um, I found that many of them uh, were family-run businesses. And these family-run businesses were entrepreneurs. And I'm going to start with TR Sports here in Hayes. Uh, TR and Sue May, um, they took a chance on me and they helped me actually put myself through school by employing me for four years. Uh, you work 30 hours a week uh, with a good family and, and a good business, and, and that taught me a lot. Uh, I move on to Chicago. Uh, Giant Step was, was run by uh, two brothers, Eric and Adam Hennigan, uh, who took a big jump. They, they, they stepped in, and, and I've learned a lot from them. And uh, most recently in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, was uh, Jim Tanner and Catherine Allegra, who had Wall Street on demand, a company that I spent about eight years with, and just to truly learn how you can, can disrupt an industry like finance with amazing tools that, that help people make investment needs as, as uh, confidently as they can. Um, each one of them taught a critical lesson to me. They, they, they are who I am now because I, I, I've paid attention and I looked at what they did. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, my own family ties to business. And you know, I think about Grandpa Pratt, and uh, you know, he he had a general store with his brother in Studley, Kansas, for a number of years. And once he sold that, he he opened a movie theater and then a drive-in theater. You know, there's there's I didn't know him that well. I I barely remember, but it, there's a spirit there that's there. And, you know, I think that's carried through with with my own parents and their family farm and how they diversify. Uh, you know, to the point where. I'm not just selling cans of worms to fishermen. I'm actually, we, you know, Dad and I re raised catfish, and Dad gave me a ledger and he taught me how to, to keep track of the sales and, and understand what you're doing. And I'm 14 years old, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll figure it out. So, um, you know, fast forward to today, Saltbox Studio. You know, as Mark said, we we help create digital experiences for for companies. Our clientele. Uh, range across the board. We have a, a, a large bull breeder in eastern Colorado, uh, one of the, the greater seed stock producers that are out there. We have uh, a custom uh, fine table manufacturer in Denver, uh, a young man who has climbed up over the last five years to build a $4 million company. And this, this gentleman, he's at a point where He's done everything himself, and now he needs to unlock that and let technology automate a few things so he can take his company further. So he's asked us to help. Um, you know, these, are, these are stories that I love because I feel like I can contribute. And in some ways, there are customers that come to us, and, and a lot of companies would pass on them because they're too small. And, and my business partner, Kevin, uh, who at one point was my client 10 years ago, is now uh, in cahoots with me. He, uh, uh, he and I have agreed that we want to take on some Robin Hood clients, and these are 10 to 15 percent of our business, where we have young startups who don't have the capacity or the know-how uh, in our field, but they've brought us along. And, and it's not that we're giving it away, but it helps keep us sharp. It helps us understand 
where the where the puck is moving down the court, and uh, at the same time they're getting the benefit of getting their message out a lot quicker. Um, one second. We started Saltbox Studio to build cool things with our friends. We've going to Chicago and working for Kellogg's, working for General Motors. Uh, moving to Boulder and working for Fidelity Investments and Scott Trade and Charles Schwab. Those were fun projects and I learned a ton. But I'm finding this, this uh, entrepreneur spirit thing kind of kicking in and, and, you know, why do it for somebody else when I can do it for myself? That was one of the big kicks. Um, I think and my wife's in the back of the room and I hope I've been able to hold up to my promise of having dinner with my family every night. That's something that doesn't always happen, but it's something that you you really want to make sure that you have a, uh, you know, a goal in mind when you think about uh, uh, starting your own thing. Now, when, when we, we started this, we, it wasn't easy off the bat. Uh, assumptions that we made in the beginning uh, didn't pan out like we wanted. We went about four or five months in that, that uh, we were struggling. Or, and what we had to do is we had to go back and, and recheck our message, recheck our, our pipeline of people that we were trying to reach out to. And then, you know, amazing things happen. We use three voices when we, when we approach our clients. These voices are lenses that we need to look through. Uh, a lot of times companies will say, I need to buy this particular piece of software because that's going to solve my problem. Well, we ask, did you really solve the right problem? Uh, and we use these three lenses to help in, uh, instill that they have indeed found the right problem, and now we can make the critical decisions that are going to affect their pocketbook. Uh, these, these things, we want to look at goals. We want to look at uh, constraints. And those could be technology. They could be real estate and a brewer. You know, how much room do you have to be able to stand up uh, you know, big fermenters and uh, you know, printing presses if, if you're doing that? You know, there's th these constraints are real, and you've got to take into account. And lastly, you need to look at people. Uh, for us, it's end users touching a keyboard or a mouse or a phone. and where are they at the time that they need information and how do we, we process that? So with goals, you know, we, we ask the hard questions. We ask businesses that, that hire us and they know it up front that, that we're their trusted advisor, but we're going to be tough on them. We're going to ask them some uncomfortable things uh, just to root out uh, where their problems are. Once we can identify those through various kinds of workshops that we conduct, uh, Sometimes the, these workshops are looked at as, as frivolous. Well, we don't need to do that. We just we know we need a website. And for us, it's, no, you actually may not need a website and save your money. Let's go through the workshop. These workshops help us identify uh, problems, pain points, bottlenecks, that we can then start to put a plan together and, and untie those things and, and effic build efficiencies within their own, industry, their own company. The, uh, uh, you know, those bottlenecks are uh, places where we see opportunity that technology can take over and allow, um, and allow the, uh, uh, the individual to do the job that they really need to be doing in person. Constraints, as I mentioned, you know, we look at constraints of, you know, companies may have, have made a huge investment, you know, six-figure, seven-figure investments in uh, technology, as Mark said, Oracle Cloud or, or Salesforce. These are very expensive terms that run over years, five years, six year terms. And so sometimes we are held to those constraints, but that's okay. Uh, you know, with that, you, know, you, you again ask, are you afraid? You have to say, okay, well, now that we have this, how do we, how do we tie this all back together? Um, and, and through that, we can, once we understand those, and it's not just Saltbox, but it's also the client, once we have, once we have all that out on the open, we can start to uh, discuss what the next steps are. And then lastly, people. Um, for end users, uh, you want to ask yourself: Are they on the go? Are they uh, sitting in be behind a computer screen at a desk? Are they out in the field? Does the field have cell reception? Uh, you know, there's, there's a number of things that play into that. You know, when, when working on uh, scotttrade.com's trading website, we had to really be concerned about how much data was being pulled through to the surface of the website. 
uh, they get complaints all the time because there are people, and they, they weren't making fun of this. This was, this was actual, but, you know, rural Nebraska at the time, five, ten years ago, and uh, uh, rural Wyoming, they had a lot of their bigger investors who were using Scottrade because it was a cheaper trading platform, but they were only using dial-up in, you know, in two, the year 2010. And so you have to consider those things before you uh, put something on the screen. Um, you know, other clients, you know, we're starting to see the desktop go, go away more and more, and this thing is becoming the way everybody else is going. Uh, it's hard to get people to break from their comfort zone. Uh, we can still put your website on this, of course, but the truly taking and breaking down all the, the actions that a company needs to do, whether they're checking their sales uh, of their inventory, uh, if they need to send a message, take a picture, all those can happen within their application. And we want to be able to build that so they're not fumbling around uh, and, and they can move on with the rest of their day. All these together give us a, a balance. And that balance is really appreciated at the end by our clients. They, they end up uh, thanking us in the end in, in more than a monetary way because we now gave them the tools to make decisions uh, and they found them very helpful when we took them through the progress that they can now conduct these things uh, and, and move forward. The, the, the balance is a, a, uh, uh, something we have to, every decision that we make, every design that we put together, any piece of software that we have, we have to uh, look through these things and challenge ourselves and challenge our clients. Uh, business owners, as we all know, and, and can be uh, aggressive they, in a friendly way. They, they have ideas. I get emails day and night from many of our, our, our people who uh, they said, I have an idea. We need to do this. And we have to tell them to slow down before they speed up because they get so far ahead of themselves, that's the reason they're in the, the position that they're in now, because sometimes they're, they're, they're a little hogtied in a way of, of uh, decisions they made in the past fairly hastily. Um, so, so then again, I, I ask, are you afraid? And I'm gonna wrap it up this way. Uh, this cattle rancher that I, I, I do work with, uh, my business partner is a city kid from St. Louis had probably never stepped foot on a farm or, or what lies on a farm, but it was, it's been gratifying to take him out there. Uh, getting to know uh, this, this rancher, he's, he's, he's a kind of a curmudgeon of a, of a guy, but he's got all the right pieces and parts. He has a, a distribution list of 25,000 people that he sends all around the world. His entire marketing operation is run through email. And what we're trying to do is un untie that, unravel that. And as we've been told, getting him onto email, he was kicking and screaming. I don't need that. I, you know, I guess getting a computer in the office was the same way. I don't need that. I don't need that. And once he took a hold of email, he ran with it. And he's got gold. He's got a really nice operation. Now, we were introduced to him. And, uh, you know, it took, it was a long sales runway to, to uh, sign the deal. And once we earned his trust, uh, just last Monday, we went to uh, Burlington, Colorado for his fall sale. And uh, he introduced us to his cooperative producers. And he introduced us and said, these guys are going to help us move forward. And so far, I think we got part of our message across with him. The second thing he said is, I'm 50% scared and I'm 50% excited. And... It, it struck me, you know, here's a guy who's been doing this for 25 years, this kind of grumpy, you know, salt-of-the-earth man, yet he's got this, this vision that's going to not get him out of the office, which is what it's supposed to do, and let his family take over. But uh, I think it's going to give him new tools to, to reinvigorate him. And, and uh, you know, and I look at that 50-50 statement, and I think every decision I've made, I've been half scared and half excited, and those are the balance pieces that help me uh, do what I do. So.
It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Tanya Valeen, and I would say I'm an accidental entrepreneur. And what I mean by that is I didn't wake up one day and say, gee, I think I'll start a business, and I think I'll distribute products into mass retail. What happened was I went looking for a product, and I couldn't find it. My father had passed away, and I really wanted to find a gift book for my mother on wid widowhood, and I just couldn't find it. And so after about four months of frustration, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to write this book myself. And I went searching for an artist, and I, boy, did I find one. Uh, her name is Jody Pedri, and this is our logo. She drew that about seven years ago, and we've just never looked back. So what happened was Jody said, you know, Tanya, I love the way you write. I love the humor that you have. I love the stories that you tell. I need you to put your words to my artwork so we can tell a story. And so our very first licensing deal was six napkins and a deck of cards. And you would have thought we landed on the moon. We were so excited. We had a national retailer called C.R. Gibson. And C.R. Gibson's a paper company. It's been around since 1895. And they walked up to our booth and they said, we think it's fabulous. We'd love to work with you women. You know, what do you need? We were like, we have no idea. Right? So we'd never done this before. We were like, well, what's your standard agreement? And they said, well, 10%. And so we said, sounds great. So the, the backstory that you don't know is the very first check we got was we get paid quarterly. We, we just had like two weeks in the quarter. So our very first check was, um, and we were so excited. We thought we were going to be instant millionaires. Our check was $12.50. So um, Jody, always the optimist, said to her daughter, her teenage daughter, well, at least we can go to Starbucks and get, you know, a, 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 something to drink and something to eat. And her daughter pointed out, actually, you can't, Mom, because you have to split that with Tanya, and you don't even have enough for that. <laughs> so we decided, you know what, we really need to start s stacking these contracts. So C.R. Gibson gave us legitimacy because we were just two women around a kitchen table drawing artwork and all of a sudden we were in hallmarks across the country. So we kind of caught what I call the trade show bug. And trade shows have been the cornerstone of how we built our business. When people say, how'd you get into Walmart? How'd you get into Target? How'd you get into Steinmeier? I always say the same thing. Trade shows. And the, the second part of that is follow up. And, and to me, if you remember nothing else from this presentation, I think it would be that you have to follow through. You are going to be led to the right people. You're going to be in the right place at the right time and make the right connections. But if you can't follow up, and really what I, what I say is over-deliver, under-promise and over-deliver, that's really what you've got to do to be successful. And so here you see, we, this is on the left is a trade show in London. We went up there and we were completely clueless. And Paul hit the nail on the head. We were afraid, okay? We're in a foreign country. People are speaking languages we don't know. They're asking if we want to do business with them. We don't know if we're talking to the Walmart, to Harrods. You know, we just really don't know. But we went ahead and did it anyway. This trade show is um, in Las Vegas. And it's called the Interna uh, International Licensing Show. And if you're ever in Vegas in the second week of June, I really encourage you to go. Because all of the material that you see when you walk into Walmart or you walk into Target or you walk into a boutique in town, I guarantee you that there's something there that's licensed. And license is simply this. Manufacturers exist, right? They have white t-shirts and white coffee cups and white, you know, canvas bags. And they need artwork. They are looking for artwork and brands to go on that material. And they come to this show. You'll see Disney here, you'll see Pixar, you'll see you know, major celebrities at the international licensing show. And that's how deals get made, and that's how the products manufacturers pair up with the artists and, and they come to you know, sit on shelves. So this is our brand, it's called Working Girls Design. We happen to think it's fabulous, and luckily for us, a lot of women age 21 to you know, upper 80s think so too. Um, we have over 3,000 pieces of artwork. And I would say that early on, I went and heard Bill Clinton speak. He was speaking at our international licensing show in Vegas. And I remember him saying distinctly, businesses can do one of three things. They can do things better, they can do things faster, or they can do things cheaper. So you need to decide with your business and your brand, what are you going to do? So think about that for a minute. Who does it better? You might say Rolex brand or... Tesla cars. They do it better, right? That's why you want their stuff. Who does it faster? FedEx does it faster. Speedy Print does it faster. Who does it cheaper? 
That might be Walmart or, you know, dollar store does it cheaper. So Jody and I sat down strategically and said, what do we want to be? Do we want to do it better? Do we want to do it faster? Do we want to do it cheaper? Well, we decided right away cheap was out the door. There were too many starving artists and we weren't going to be the cheap. Okay, so we could either do it better or faster. And we elected to, we, we could say we're the best, but really Hello Kitty is a billion dollar brand. You know, you're not anywhere except on a deck, deck of cards and some napkins. So other than mother believing that I'm the best, that's probably not accurate. So I said, you know what, we're going to do it the fastest. So we built 3,000 images quickly. We set up an email database. We had Facebook fans of over 8,000 in just a couple years. And we, we worked really fast. And that boded well for us because manufacturers knew if they got to us within a day or two, we, if we didn't have the artwork, we'd create it and get it back to them. So we relatively quickly, within a short amount of time, we had these calendars. The top calendar I'm particularly proud of, it says Girl Gone Pink. We partnered with the Susan G. Komen Foundation and raised over $25,000 for breast cancer awareness. Um, we also got that particular calendar, got into Costco and sold over half a million dollars in one, um, you know, one season. And so that's the power of a brand that you believe in partnering with the right manufacturers. Um, we also have, you know, relax and calm down and have a cocktail. That's been our signature um, calendar. It comes out every year. We have what we call fanatical fans. They collect it every year. We look forward to that. Um, this bottom one is a Christmas display. And Christmas is huge, as you know, for most retailers. So we were excited that we had an entire Christmas line as well. So um, our next big um, really find was to get into Steinmart. And I'm just going to pass this around. I never get tired of this. This is the Steinmart flyer. And we are on the back page for Worker Girls. And so you can take it. And what was so exciting about this was <clears throat> that they began to see us as a brand and put us in their national magazine, right? So now we're not spending our dollars, but our brand is getting national exposure. And it's been our most lucrative line and our most stable line. We've, we've been doing it now for five years. And women collect it and call from all over the country. Another cool thing that once you land an account like Steinmart, other accounts come calling. We have our own line of checks. We did African American, we did ethnic, we did Asian, we did all of these different women that you really couldn't find in the marketplace. And it really helped blow up the brand as well. We landed our first book, which I'm very excited about. It's called Willow Creek Press, Mother of the Year. Um, we actually, I've written a 77,000 word novel and that book will be coming out next year. So in addition to the gift books, we now have our first novel that's working girls based. Um, Herod's of London was a fantastic um, find. This happened when we were in New York. Um, the center person is Jane, she's from London, and she came walking up and she, she, in her best British accent, she said she was in love with the brand and could we put our working girls on the Herod's coffee cup? Of course we said, yes! Um, and what was cool about it is that coffee cup now sells for Herod's of London, it, it now sells for $14.95, and that's British pounds. So if you do the, the translation, that's actually 22 US dollars. So it's been very lucrative for us to partner up with Harrods and, and have our products sold internationally. Our last um, success story has been to get into Walmart, and this was seven years in the making. Um, we were fortunate that our manufacturer that we worked with, who's out of New York, had some contacts there. And last qu quarter of 2014, we were fortunate we did about a million dollars in sales with just the glasses alone. So um, it's something that we're excited about. They did a test run in 300 Walmarts. It went well, and so they expanded the line. We are now set to go back in. Looks like third quarter of next year. So that's the story. Those are two very difficult acts to follow. All I do is make beer. <laughs> So Wichita Brewing Company, the idea for Wichita Brewing Company was conceived on a, we'll call it a semi-drunken night in 2009. So this was my third attempt at a legitimate business, 
not that I've ever attempted an illegitimate business. <laughs> um, my first attempt at starting, uh, starting a company was actually when I was a student at Fort Hayes. Um, a friend of mine and I, Dustin Hers, started Horn and Hers Holdings, LLC. We, um, we purchased rental real estate in the sort of around campus. We wound up with four houses. Um, there were two elements of the three that I think are necessary for a successful business that we had. One was um, the circumstances. There was available real estate, we could purchase at good cap rates, you know, we could get a good return on our investment, and also capital. Um, we were able to, in hindsight, it's almost scary how a student who waited tables and made $12,000 a year could go, buy, could go borrow $120,000 to buy a house. But, uh, so the capital was available. So you know, we bought houses, we managed them, and it uh, it worked out. It worked out fine. We 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 were able to make some money. Um, my second attempt at at starting a business was Web Investment Group. Web standing for Warren Edward Buffett. So a private investment company. Um, I when I left Fort Hayes, I took a job as an investment analyst at American Underwriters Life Insurance Company, where I still work as a portfolio manager now. But um, Unfortunately, the dreams that I had of graduating from, you know, from college with a finance degree and making millions of dollars right off the bat didn't quite pan out as an investment analyst for a small insurance, or for a small insurance company in Wichita, Kansas. Um, so I thought, you know, I thought to myself, I need to do something. I've got to make some more money. I, I mean, I'm a, I have a finance degree. That's what I do is money, right? So um, I convinced my boss that the conflicts of interest weren't that significant. Um, you know, managing private money and also helping him manage uh, manage the money for the insurance company. So we started Web Investment Group. Um, we raised about a million dollars, just under a million, just under a million dollars. Um, so with that with that venture, we also had two of the three necessary um, elements, in my opinion, to starting a successful business. We had. The passion. I love finance. I love investment. That's. I mean, that's what I studied. I, you know, I'm, I'm. I'm a nerd that way. I love reading about. You know, I. I sit with uh, bated breath, waiting for uh, Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder meeting to come out. Just, I, the passion was there. We had great passion. My partner and I. Um, we had the circumstances in that my. You know, my boss allowed us to, um, in spite of the conflicts of interest, you know, run some private money. But we didn't have the capital. You know, a million dollars may sound like a lot, but in money ma in the money management business, it's it's nothing. Uh, you know, you, you cannot make a living managing one million dollars. So, uh, step forward to Wichita Brewing Company, and actually, ironically enough, the the two first uh, Horn and Hearst Holdings and Web Investment Group, when I wound those down in 2010, it provided the capital to start. My, my part of the capital to start Wichita Brewing Company. So back to the, what I was calling a semi-drunken night in 2009, um, I, was, I was home brewing, making beer in my garage with my, uh, who is now uh, my friend, who is now my business partner. And he said, you know, you've been doing this for four years and this stuff is starting to taste good. You should try to sell it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. You know, I'm sure the conversation went on and on and on about how we could make a million dollars in the brewing industry. But within a week, just out of the blue, I think I was at lunch, he called me and said, hey, I just talked to this bar manager, and she said if, if you're making good beer, she would put it on tap. Sight unseen, if it's local and it tastes good, she'll put it on tap. So that really got the wheels turning. You know, man, maybe we could do this. The stuff is tasting okay. It's really fun to do, and uh, and everything. The planet just kind of aligned. Like the, the the three things that that have helped us. We had the capital. We had um, we had the circumstances in Wichita. You know, the Wichita MSA Metropolitan Statistical Area has 600,000 people. At the time, there was only one other locally owned brewery in this in the entire city in the entire area. So circumstances were great. Um, you know, Wichita in Kansas in general is very underserved in this particular industry relative to Boulder, Colorado or someplace like that. Um, and, and we had the passion. You know, I was, I was the guy when I was in college, you know, like I said, very, very much a business nerd, avoided science as much as possible. I took a five-hour calculus class at Fort Hayes to avoid having to take a biology class, right? 
but now I'm, you know, I, I read biology type stuff. I have water chemistry books because all of, this, all of these things go into making, you know, you know, making good beer. So uh, the passion has been extraordinary, and I think that's probably, of, of the three-legged stool, that is the most important part. You know, it's not about the money. When I started Horn and Hers, we lacked passion. We just wanted to get rich. We thought we were going to buy all this real estate and make a million bucks. That was the only reason we did it. But in starting, you know, starting the brewery, we did it because we wanted to start a brewery. Of course, we did our financial analysis and did everything to make sure that it was a viable concept. But the primary goal wasn't to, you know, to make a bunch of money and then get to come talk to you, you fine folks, you know, on a very rainy day in, in 2015. So, I guess my 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 end point is to pursue your passions, especially if you're trying to start a business. Do something that you want to do, do something that you love to do, and then, you know, the success will, the, the success will just happen on its own. Well, all three of these are very inspirational. And there's one common theme that every one of them are in an industry where there's a lot of competition, and yet they've been successful. Tanya, your story is particularly uh, fascinating to me. Uh, you found an opportunity in an industry that a textbook, if I would tell my management students, it's dying, and there's not a lot of growth opportunity, yet you found an opportunity and you've, you've made it happen. Has anyone ever told you you're not going to make it because of Hallmark, you know, the, the greeting card industry is dying, the gift industry is very competitive, so if someone ever told you no, how did you know you're going to make it? What kept you going? Well, I think it's interesting that all three of us up here have business partners. And I wouldn't be where I'm at without Jody. Because when we did get told no, which is often and still all the time, um, we would look at each other and say, nah, it's still going to happen. Right? And so there was this push. We, we kept pushing one another. So the partnership thing, especially having the right partner, it's like having a good marriage. Uh, the right business partner is such an asset. And I would say she was instrumental, number one. Number two is that we just had a core belief. And, and I would say that, you know, there's a belief in, in what Paul is doing. You're believing in your beer, which, you know, you got to believe in something, right? great. We believe we'll, we sell a lot of wine glasses, right? So, but find something that you believe in and, and stick with it because you are going to hear no's all the time from your competitors, for, even from our manufacturers. Second year in, this particular brand, our biggest manufacturer said, these girls are dead. They're not going anywhere else. You guys need to come up with something new. And we just looked at each other and we said, it's time to find a new manufacturer. Now, the twist of that story is that that same manufacturer is the one that landed the Walmart deal. So he was wrong and we were right. We don't tell him that. <laughs> but he, was, he wasn't correct. And so my biggest advice would be if someone in some high position or what you perceive to be a high position is telling you you're wrong or you're, it's not going to work, that's just one person's opinion. And that's ultimately not what's going to decide the success of your business. You are and what you believe. All three of you, Tanya, I think you'd probably just answer this question I was about to ask, but in all three of your stories, it seemed like there was a moment where that people component really came in and gave a boost to what your passion and what you were pursuing. So with the brewery, you mentioned a partner. With Paul, you mentioned a partner from Missouri. And Tanya, you just talked about your partner. I think a lot of entrepreneurs kind of get the passion part. Certainly, you shouldn't pursue anything you don't have a passion for. And always in the back of their mind is the resource part. I've got to find capital. I've got to find a way to leverage this opportunity. But they downplay the importance of the people part and finding that talent, that founding team, those partners you're going to begin this business with to grow in the future. How important is that people component? For us, being, being, uh, you know, being in the restaurant business, um, in effect, the pe people are, I mean, one of the most important aspects of the business. I mean, from the top down, my business partner and I are complete opposites. He's very, uh, very crafty, artsy. Um, you know, he likes to design things. He's designed both of our restaurants, the layout and, and the decor. And I'm more, you know, I like to read and look at numbers and whatnot. So we, we've complemented ourselves in, in that where, uh, 
we have complementary skills. So we do, you know, we've, we've had our disagreements. We don't always get along very well because we are opposites, but it's also played, you know, very well to the ultimate success of the business. Um, I think it's interesting that Tanya said she mentioned marriage with a business partner. We actually, we call ourselves our work wives. <laughs> actually, he refers to himself as mean dad and calls me nice mom. But how it, it is like a marriage. I mean, it's so important to have the right person, you know, complimenting you on the, you know, in some aspect of the business. But then take it down a level. We learned the hard way. When we were first starting, we were kind of on a shoestring budget. We, we number one goal, we didn't want to bring in investors. We wanted it to be him and I, just the two of us. And we didn't want to borrow a lot of money because, you know, I mean, you open a business or you open a restaurant, who knows what the odds are of actually ultimately su succeeding and being able to pay off that loan, but they aren't good. So those were the two goals, no partners and very little debt. So we were op we were doing everything ourselves, all the construction work. I was the you know I was the legal guy doing all the research for you know regulations, uh, licensing, compliance, and all this all these things. And um, so, kind of in that theme, we tried to shortcut hiring managers. We were we were you know we were hiring very uh, inexperienced younger people. They may have had some management experience, but very little. We in, uh, with the ultimate goal of trying to save a few dollars. And that did not work the first time, the second time, or the third time. And then finally, we, you know, we got smart enough to hire someone who was a little bit older, had a lot of experience, just so happened they cost us a little bit more money. And ever since then, we've been able to focus on other things. Growing the business is the big thing. Before, we were at the restaurant all the time, and we just weren't able to do anything outside of that because we were, we were having to manage the managers. So. I guess I can't, I can't, uh, I can't say, it's impossible to explain how important the people, whether it's your partner, whether it's your managers, whether it's your staff, how important they are because everyone is an ambassador to your business and, and you want them to represent you the way you would represent yourself. It's funny, I also have a work wife. And we, we joke about that. Actually, Kevin and I, uh, as I mentioned, we've been together for 10 years and uh, about five years ago, we were sitting poolside on a, on a, we were traveling quite a bit, about every two weeks, and we were in Santa Clara, California, uh, and we were talking, and, and we, we said, hey, why, do, why don't we do this for ourselves? That's where it started, but we didn't actually start the business until April this year, April Fool's Day, actually. Um, we, we sat down, and we, he's very much, we have a similar relationship, because he's outgoing and flamboyant. He's He's kind of the, the class clown in a way, and, and I'm the introvert. And, and five years ago, we landed on a name that we thought would be a good working title for a company called Loud and Clear. And being a user experience firm and that uh, focused on, on those kind of digital experiences. And, and it's, it's so right to have, have that confidant and, and that we can focus. We, we know each other. We know each other's movements. We, we can finish each other's sentences in a way. And it, you have to have that. Uh, it, it's helpful to have that, I should say, to, to have that partner in crime that, that uh, you can trust, you can say anything to. Uh, we just, you know, one of our underlying tenants in our company is to be uh, respectful. I think so many businesses miss the respect, and if we're respectful to each other, we can, we can lay it all out there in the open, much like we do with our clients. You, you poke holes in things and, and, and tell them he's wrong, but do it with respect. And that that opens it up and, and it clears the air and it lets us get to what we really need to get done. So, Just as a follow-up, just for a takeaway for students, and would, would you agree that a, a lot of students I talk to, they have their idea, they have their passion, but the way they're framing it and focusing on it, they're, pardon the pun, wanting to be a lone wolf entrepreneur. So it's sort of counterintuitive. I get my idea, I think I find my opportunity, and the very next thing I need to do is go find people is go find the talent. So I've got to broaden that rather than kind of be the mad scientist in my own lab doing my own chemistry to unleash on the world. Would you agree that's, that's a takeaway for students that they need to form that team and try to get to that team early? I, while I got the mic, I, I have two clients. Both are lone wolves. Uh, the table manufacturer, uh, he did it himself. He built the table, sold it on Craigslist, built it again in a week sold that and that's what took off. He, he found himself kind of 
in a bird's nest of ideas that, that had them scattered and, and not focused, and that's why you brought us in. So if you are the lone wolf, partner with people who you can trust that, that have your belief. Uh, belief is, is so important uh, in understanding that, that company. Uh, the second is a former NCAA, uh, actually from Gunnison, a Division A uh, basketball coach, or a Division II basketball coach, who were helping with a, a, uh, an application. And he is a lone wolf but he's missing that partnership. And that's where he's kind of brought us in for that. So even if it's not a direct partner in your LLC and your S Corp, is, is uh, find those people who have your back. They don't want just your wallet, but they, have your, they, they can support your ideas. I would agree with that as well. And I think it's so important to, it's not just you, let's say you do take on a business partner, you're gonna need the right accountant. Uh, you may need the right lawyer. Um, about three years in, we had a case where our artwork was, all, for all practical purposes, stolen and putting, put on products to the tune of half a million dollars in Michael's, a national retailer. Uh, we sought out legal counsel and paid for that and, you know, received a, a nice six-figure settlement from that. So your team may not just be a business partner. It may be the accountant, the lawyer, the money manager, the finance. Seek those people out because that you're going to need them to grow your business. It's impossible to be the lone wolf. You just can't, you can't build it big if you're going to try to do it all on your own. Well, Tanya, you've hit on a point. that I, So we have Boulder, Las Vegas, and Wichita. What role did the community and people in your community play in helping you develop your business? And could you have developed your business here in Western Kansas? Well, I believe anything's possible. Uh, absolutely, I think we could have built our business. Would it have been, had it, uh, some extra challenges? You bet, because one of our biggest accounts is a souvenir account, and Las Vegas just happens to be a really great place to sell lots and lots of souvenirs. Um, the other thing is that we do a lot of trade shows, and those trade shows come to Vegas. But I do believe when you have a great idea and you want to pursue it now with the Internet, with being able to Skype, being able to talk, you know, I would say 98% of our contacts we don't meet with face-to-face. -face. We meet over the phone or over the Internet. So absolutely, you can build it anywhere. If you're moving the brewery to Hayes, I'll move back. Uh, you know, the... the it, it's tough, you know. Boulder is is uh, is the nation's largest holder of startups per capita in the country. Um, it it my last job, I helped try to resource and find 22,000 square feet. We we grew from five people in my basement to about 75 people uh, a year ago, uh, which meant we were scattered across three different properties. Uh, the 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 real estate was at 95% capacity, and we were looking for 22,000 square feet, just get that out there. The, the hard part is finding additional talent across different things. With Hayes and its infrastructure, making sure if you have uh, you know, the airport running, you've got the planes coming in twice a day, uh, you've got the interstate. You know, for our type of business, we work remotely a lot. I, sat at my mom's kitchen table just this morning answering emails with a development partner in Johannesburg, South Africa this morning uh, just to keep them going. They're kind of our offshore operations. You know, you have, uh, you have the means, uh, just be intuitive about it. Use the tools that are out there. Google applications are free uh, or very cheap for an, uh, an enterprise. Uh, you have your spreadsheets. You don't need big software licenses. These are the things we tell our clients that are stuck in office you know that that have these things that, and it, it it's these things are out there to to make it very easy for you so that you can focus on your ideas has anyone been to gellas before <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously of course i mean based on the success of gellas and uh and now defiance brewing we could have done just fine in Hayes. we could we've opened two restaurants on opposite ends of town and then bought a warehouse for a production scale operation, you know, maybe not, but I mean, Hayes has everything that it, that it needs. There's plenty of people. There's a there's a there's a great market. Um, we could have done well. I say that maybe we couldn't have done just fine because Gell's is a fantastic establishment. All right. At this point, we're going to go to our audience, and we have a couple of helpers with microphones. Where are you, folks? That um, 
uh, stand up so that uh, audience members can see you and can hail you. Who would like to be our, our first audience member to ask a question? Don't be shy on this rainy day. Yes, we'll start up here and then to the back. Yeah, bring a microphone, please. Tanya, you said you decided to start with 3,000 designs. And what made you decide on that number? Did you do research or you just decided 3,000? Well, that's just, um, we just sent a, be a benchmark out there. I mean, there are companies, art licensing companies that have 30,000, but since there was only two of us, um, that's just, and we didn't even actually consciously say we're gonna have 3,000 designs, but we just landed some contracts that were requiring us to complete al almost 100 pieces of artwork every two weeks. And so that's just where we ended up with, with that number. But it, it kind of even surprised us when we sat down and counted them. <laughs> And how'd you handle that pressure of having to do that much within two weeks? You know, it was, it was passion. I mean, it's, you keep hearing the same theme up here, but it is true. I mean, if you're just chasing something for the money or for the, you know, the end game, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen near as easily and fluently if you're just passionate about it. You get up at seven or eight in the morning and you go, wow, what can I create today? And, you know, there are people in this room that are going to create amazing things. I don't know if it's applications. I don't know if it's processes. I don't know if it's actual products. But you're going to have these ideas. And the only thing you're going to have to do is just follow through. That's the biggest thing is take that idea, whatever's up here or whatever's on the paper, and keep applying it every single day. And that's just what we did. That's how we got to 3,000 because it just... It was so easy to do that, and easy and hard at the same time. I and mean, she had a lot more work than I did, but we, we had a passion for what we were doing, for sure. Remarkable story. Let's go to the back. This can go to um, all three of you guys. Is, was it difficult to initially get people to also see your vision and to get on board? Yeah, and I guess it's hard to specify who those who those people were that were difficult to convince, but I mean, there, you know, there are a lot of naysayers, you know, haters are going to hate. Uh, there's, a, there's a million, there's a million reasons why you shouldn't do this. You have a family, your wife's pregnant, you have a job. How are you going to handle having a job and a second job? Uh, so yeah, I um, guess I'm having a hard time enunciating it. I guess the flip side of that is there are also a lot of supporters. Um, in my, you know, in my scenario specifically, um, like I had mentioned, Wichita and Kansas in general is kind of an underserved market for craft beer, and there is a very large audience in Wichita that that was very enthusiastic about about what we were doing. You know, we're finally going to have an, a, another craft brewery, and whatnot. But I get, to answer your question specifically, yes, there were a lot of people that gave us a million reasons why we shouldn't do what we wanted to do. But the fact of the matter is we wanted to do it. And although, you know, I'm a very fallible person, I'll listen to other people's opinions and take their advice, you know, as much as I see fit. But I'm also stubborn and I tend to ultimately do what I want to do. So, you know, you kind of you kind of block block out the people who are just simply telling you shouldn't do something for the sake of telling you you shouldn't do something. I guess I I'm pretty good at just ignoring ignoring something like that. Yeah, and I, I would say that they didn't really say you shouldn't do it. They just said, we don't like what you've done, right? So that's going to happen. You're going to come up with this idea, this product, this process, this service, and you're going to go to your potential client, the person who's going to exchange money with you. And that's really who you need to be getting answers from. Your mom may say it's great. Your, mother, your brother may say it's stupid. But at the end of the day, neither one of those people are probably your clients. So go to the person who's going to potentially give you money and see what they have to say. And I would say we went to a lot of those people. They said, no, we don't like your artwork. It's too cartoonish. We don't like your humor. We don't think it's funny. You know, whatever reason they happen to say. And we had a four-letter word we always used. And the four-letter word is next. So we just moved on to the next. Nice. Yeah, we, we partner with a, a number of web development and engineering firms. And, and word of mouth uh, comes to us. I, our previous reputations have, have held true, and that's nationwide. And it's opened doors to 
a, a variety of things. Uh, one client is, is an Internet of Things company that has machines talking to machines. And it's, it's still in its infancy, but they believe that we can help them and help them maybe unlock opportunities there. And, and it's, it's those types of relationships that we have made over the last 10 years or so together that when people have heard that we've paired up together, that, that, that's become a, one of our stronger points. And, and we like to have fun. We, we're kind of the, we come crashing in a little bit and disrupt their offices. And the offices can be stuffy and, and very beige. And, and you know, we bring a little bit of light into these companies. And that's, uh, you know, it, it's a break in their day. And, and it gets them excited about their product again. And, uh, you know, that those, are the, the, those are the positives I have. Next question from the audience. Um, we have one from Twitter for Jeremy from Dr. Mike Martin. He wants to know if you come up with all the beer varieties yourself. So I was the, I was the home brewer behind this entire thing. So yes, I, um, although I don't actually make the beer anymore, we have employees that do that. I'm still actively involved in, in generating the beer recipes. That's, I mean, that's the fun part. Making a beer recipe, you know, it sound, I don't know, it, it doesn't, doesn't sound difficult at all, but really what we do, I get together with my head brewer, we go to, um, you know, a great beer liquor store in Wichita, get a number of different examples of the style that we're trying to make, and then we go to my house and, you know, open our computer program, sample, 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 make a beer recipe. So, of course, I'm involved with that. <laughs> Very interesting. I'd like to ask each of the three of you, you have some experience under your belt now. What's the key thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you started your business? I think I would, I would go back to the people. The people aspect of, uh, of our business is, is just absolutely key. And, you know, whether or not you choose to, choose to, to uh, take on a business partner to help with things, you have to have the right people. And, and we learned that the hard way, like I'd mentioned with um, our, us trying to be cheapskates, you know, in paying, in paying our salaried managers, um, without a doubt. And it goes all the way down to the guy washing dishes in a restaurant. Everyone is important. If, if, if someone is dropping the ball, something, you know, farther down the process line is also going to go, to go badly. So for me, it's, in our business specifically, it is absolutely the people. I think one of the things I wish I would have like paid a little bit more attention to is in, in real estate, there's a, there's a saying, it's called location, location, location. Well, it, w with entrepreneurships and startups, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And it really is important to, you know, maybe you don't like QuickBooks, but you need to get familiar with QuickBooks. You need to understand money's coming in, money's coming out. And really without cash flow, you don't really have a business, okay? I mean, you, you need that. Um, we were adamant we didn't want to go into debt. Um, we had $2,000 startup money. Thank you, mother. And uh, she believed in me, right? And it uh, paid off. But you really have to understand how, where the money, you've got to follow the money. You, you, you can't, your ideas at, at some point have to go to paper, and from paper they have to turn to product or processes that it creates a cash flow exchange. You are in business. You're not running a nonprofit. You are there to make a profit, and it's perfectly okay to do that. You're going to pay taxes at the end of the year. That's a good thing, right? So pay attention in finance class. You're going to need that. Well, more importantly, enroll in finance class, enroll in business. That's my biggest regret, uh, and I don't like regret as a word, but that's one of the things that I, I missed in my undergrad is I didn't take a business class. I understood, understood the core tenants, but it, from a, a very novice point of view. Um, a month after 9-11, I was laid off in Chicago. The, the market for designers was terrible. Um, I have a lot to owe. I owe a lot to uh, my wife's father, who Larry Grimsley, who was an accounting professor here, who I spent many evenings on the phone with him getting uh, kind of the boot camp of, of Business 101 up. And, uh, you know, I, I owe a lot of gratitude to, to that. And the funny part is my new passion, my, my, my design was my skill, but my new passion was this is fun. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, I, it, you know, you wait for the phone to ring or you hit the street and you try to find work. And, you know, you really, uh, you, you, you really got to have those, those things to understand the inflows and outflows. Is, is, it, that's how it works. And 
just so you're, you're prepared for the surprises. There will be surprises, but if you're prepared, uh, you can take tackle it. I'm going to put in a plug. Regardless of your major, we have a uh, four-course certificate in entrepreneurship that these two gentlemen and others have been instrumental in developing. Whether you're an egg major or you're a zoology major or anything in between, uh, you're certainly welcome to be part of that, uh, that curriculum and that certificate. Let's go with another question from the audience. I see a hand uh, right over here and then one behind him. This one's for Tanya. I was wondering, uh, would you have any game boards available for your brand? Any, I'm sorry? Like a game board for uh, just like games that you play, like a board game? It's, it's interesting you say that. We developed um, some, some game boards with our manufacturer. They never actually made it to market, but, but that's an area I'm very interested in. I was just saying because it's about to be Christmas and I'll be able to play a game with my mom or something. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a really cool idea. <laughs> Maybe, maybe you should develop the game board, and I'll, I'll uh, license you the art. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can we hand the microphone to Dan, please? I'm curious if both of, all of you touched on your initial sources of financing. Um, could you give us some more information as far as initial sources for initial financing? And also, what importance did the, the business plan play in securing that <coughs> Okay, I'm going to repeat that question so that we can capture that on video. But the question is, what type of initial financing did you have? And also, what importance did your business plan play in actually getting your business off the ground and running successfully? I've been fairly fortunate with a, a number of roles that I've taken. Um, and uh, uh, over time, I've had, had just built up savings at this point. This last year has, has been... Uh, a lot of savings, you know, paying for health insurance for a family of four, um, food, and, and still be able to enjoy life from time to time. But really for our business, it's been uh, an initial investment of mostly time and savings to, to buy the initial equipment of software, uh, equipment, so uh, laptops, and, and so on. Um, and then off of that, you uh, uh, kind of have a Hail Mary of... Uh, making sure that you, you get that first client to get in and, and uh, start paying the bills. And Paul, did you have a formal business plan? Uh, we did. We, we sat down together uh, earlier in the year to, to draft out our, our first and foremost goal in the first year was to make salary. Uh, and we fell short on that. Uh, but it was, a, it was an ambitious goal. Uh, we we've ran really lean. And, uh, you know, like I said, time is your friend and your enemy. Uh, the friendly part swept in uh, in the latter half of this year and, and has really kind of helped keep us afloat. So We were self-funded as well. I mean, I had the 2000 initially from mom. And luckily, I didn't have to go back there. She probably would have said yes. But um, with the, the cash flow that came in, we reinvested that into the business. Um, I think there's a lot of cool opportunities out there from GoFundMe to uh, corporate financing. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely there if you've got a great idea, and especially if you have things patented and trademarked, things like that. There's definitely options on that. But we really wanted to avoid debt, so we didn't go that route. We did a lot of planning, uh, developing business plans initially, m mainly for our own internal purposes. Now, we did have to borrow money. Um, but we, my partner Greg and I, provided a, a significant per percentage of the startup capital. Um, I have a great relationship with a small town bank in Almina, Shad Chandler. He's one of my closest friends. And um, I had been borrowing money from him since I bought a Ford Thunderbird, I think, in like 1996. So he, he was the, fi you know, he financed all of our rental properties in Hayes. So we have a great relationship. He trusts me, I pay my bills. So we didn't have to do a whole lot of, of planning in terms of you know developing a business plan, providing financial projections to to get him to say yes. Um, but for our expansion, we use uh, SB, we used SBA guarantees to get you know to get um, the funding for the second restaurant and our production facility. And for that process, yes, there was a significant amount of. Um, business plan type paperwork that they required, financial projections, you know, for multiple years, 
very long narratives, what we intend to do, where we intend to be, you know, two, three, four, five years from now. So for the expansion part of our business, um, doing a, a lot of very thought, thoughtful type planning, um, projecting was, was, a, was, was, a, was a required key element to the, to the finance portion of it. Well, our time always seems to go very rapidly. I know we have more questions, and we're going to have actually an opportunity at 2 o'clock in McCartney 109 for students to talk with uh, our entrepreneurs uh, in a very small uh, setting if you'd like to come then. And I uh, uh, welcome uh, you as students to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, today, I'd like to close by first thanking President Martin for hosting this event and for uh, welcoming everybody and being part of this. Secondly, I'd like to thank each of our entrepreneurs, Paul, Tanya, and Jeremy. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our two panelists, uh, Henry Schwaller and Charlie Wolf. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this, and let's show our appreciation for our speakers. Thank you.